the song is more than a song, and I think it became an anthem. I'm not a white rapper, by the way. I'm a rapper. You don't label music with colors. It's made for your ears, not your eyes. It reflects the 90s, and the 90s was the last of the great decades. So it's 1990. I'm in Germany at a refugee camp, and this is the era of Baywatch. Germany had won the World Cup, and then all of a sudden, they start talking about this song that's coming out that's famous in America. And everybody in Germany is playing the song in their cars, in the clubs, at refugee camps. It didn't matter where you were, everybody was playing this song called Ice, Ice Baby by a man named Vanilla Ice. <laughs> and we're hanging out with him today, so. What a, what a wild uh, uh, twist from a refugee camp, listen to your song. Now we're hanging out at your house while you got the project, the Vanilla Ice Project, that background noise is right behind us in yep. a winter of Florida, which is very freezing. Obviously, it's cold weather. Oh, yeah. It's I'm terrible. So cold. Yeah, it's challenging Had to times. jacket sweating. on for this, you know. It's... So, brother, it's good to be here with you at your house. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. You, you got one of the coolest stories with a lot of lessons in it that a lot of people can learn from, and it's inspirational story that you got that I want to kind of get into it so we you start bet. not uh, a problem be before I, I go to that when I was in the army it's 97 I went to a club in South Carolina wow we went to a club in South Carolina they're playing ice ice baby I'm in Nashville Tennessee we go to a club called mix factory ice ice baby I went to a country club in Nashville it's called Silverado they're playing Ice Ice Baby. Nice. I mean, this is like Ice Ice Baby is played Line uh, dancing. all over the place. So what happened? How did this thing go from, you know, here's a kid, you're going back and forth from Dallas, Miami, your family, mom and dad, and then you write a song at 16, and then t tell us the story about how this thing whole came about to Ice Ice Baby. Basically, I had a fake ID. Uh, I was uh, in Dallas, it was my brother's, he's five years older, so I took his driver's license, he could never find it, and that was my fake ID. So I would take that and I would get in, get in clubs and stuff, and I went to this club over uh, on Martin Luther King Boulevard called City Lights. I went in there, and they're having a talent contest, I had no idea. And, um, and my buddy says, man, you should get in there and do that, because I come from breakdancing era. I grew up to like Parliament, Funkadelic, Rick James, Zap, Roger Troutman. What were some of the, some of the movies, right? Beat Street, Beat Street, Break, in, break in, was, Turbo, yeah. Ozone, yeah. the whole wave yeah. and everything. And I had the mirror, but I had a breakdance crew, so I was 14 years old. And I would go to the mall and I would spin on my head and I'd make 40 bucks a day, <laughs> chase the girls around the mall, eat some pizza, have some change left over. And that was more than all the rich kids could get from across the town, you know? Wow. And, uh, and I loved doing it. So we would go out every day, big ghetto blaster, piece of cardboard, right, when, right at the most busy door where people coming in and out. And it was the greatest thing ever. Uh, got really good at it just by having fun. And then we had underage keg drinking parties. And all the high schools would come together and we would, you know, keg parties. And we would battle each other from other schools like rap, beatboxing, and breakdancing. This is here or this is Dallas? This is Dallas, Texas. Got it. And uh, I was at R.L. Turner High School and uh, in Farmer's Branch. Not Carrollton. Farmers people people thought I was from Carrollton because that's more where the richer people yeah. live. And what a blast I had at that school. So we would go to Prestonwood Mall, which doesn't exist anymore. The Galleria does. We would, you know, but it was even before that. There was, I mean, it was the most amazing breakdance movement ever. And that's what influenced me. And that's, where, that's why when it was time for me to sit down and, and write music, um, that, that's what influenced me. So that's what was going to come out. So I was heavily into poetry even before the music, which is kind of everything kind of tied together and then drove me in that direction. How did that happen? How did po poetry happen with you? Poetry came in, in uh, and I was horrible in English and horrible in school in, in English, but uh, somehow I just r related to poetry more than anything on the planet. Even, till, even to this day, everything is poetry with me. Like, um, I can give you thousands of dollars worth of therapy by just saying a few little phrases that'll change your whole mindset. Like, Yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery. That's so, you know, I don't have to sit down and tell you everything about it. Just think about it a little bit. Or we are who we are because of who we were. Or just all this comes from poetry. You know, from Edgar Allan Poe to all the different poets throughout life. I always just gravitate 
some even some as a kid you were gravitating towards, towards poetry. poetry always so is that what led to writing the song or how did that happen it led to definitely to to writing the song and make me who i am you know because um i wanted to express myself and then the influence of the hip hop culture movement had that influence in me and then the poetry and it was only natural that i write and do the way what i did you know i didn't know any other way of of doing it you know who who had the most influence at that time with the hip hop culture cuz 1990 who's around in 1990 this is pre dre tupac this is pre this is pre those guys yeah. right yeah i was uh I was at that club City Lights and I said my my buddy says, "Man, get up on stage, get into this uh talent contest." I said, "No way, man." He says, "Get up on stage." I said, "Okay." <laughs> and I did it and I thought it was going to be like a joke cuz I'm kind of a jackass, you know, like before jackass. I don't take anything too serious. So I I said, "All right, I'll get up there." He kind of dared me, you know. I was a daredevil guy. I raced motocross and all that. I'll do it, whatever. I'm definitely not scared. So I did it and um I turned it out, man, and I and when I got off stage, I went to the bar, <laughs> and these guys were passing me cards. Uh, hey, man, I'm with Capitol Records. Uh, I'm with all these record companies, EMI. You know, everybody mm -hmm. was in the house, and then, and I was I didn't believe any of them because I'm in the hood. I mean, this is straight hood, and I'm like, you guys just printed up some business cards, and you're just trying to you know come up here to get the females and hang out, right? <laughs> I'm not buying it. You you would not be here if you were with this record company. You wouldn't be in this spot. I got one card, man, and, I, and it was Itchy Bond Records out of Atlanta, and I landed a, a small record deal with Curtis Mayfield, who was on the label mm -hmm. at the time, and I sold like forty thousand copies of Ice Ice Baby, and then uh, and then it was picked up by the majors. I was only sixteen when I wrote that song, so it's incredible. It was nineteen wow. when it when it blew up. So when it blew up, it it uh, it took on a life of its own, and you never know because I don't have like a favorite song out of all my catalog. I don't say, oh, that's my favorite one. It's you know your your fans pick you you don't pick them that's, so that's so strange that's the part like how do you you didn't even know this thing was going to take off the way it did oh nobody could predict what so happened so what was it was there and like you know today they talk about this video went viral that video went viral this movie went viral this campaign went viral was there a single event a radio show a concert an endorsement that somebody played was it an LA thing was it a New York thing what happened for it to go viral the way it did well it it takes people to gravitate towards it and i think the song is more than a song and i think it became an anthem almost to the point where it surpasses a number one hit song and it just takes on a life of your own becomes an anthem when when people listen to the song and they remember like a photographic memory who they dated in high school what kind of clothes they wore maybe they ripped out their back seat and put in subwoofers and they can play this song and it all comes back without going through a no photo doubt. album so it reaches a level of like beyond a number one hit song yeah. because there's been number one hit songs from here to to then that you probably can't even remember you're like oh yeah that Mariah Carey song that was number one yeah okay you know but you don't it doesn't really impact your life I think that it impacted people's life with a movement of pop culture. And I think the pop culture and the fashion together really defines a certain generation. And so that kind of is the anthem, My Size Baby and the Ninja Rap are the anthem of the 90s. What what was special about what you did is you were able to get cuz at that time, you know, hip hop typically the people who listen to hip hop, it wasn't Caucasians, you know, it wasn't like, you know, no. I it didn't was, have any uh, white audience at all when I came, when I came out I opened up for Ice T, Stats of Sonic, EPMD, Sir Mix a Lot. I was on the Stop the Violence tour. Right. My whole audience was always black and that's just rap music. I I thought it was always going to be that way. I didn't think it would ever change and that's who I catered to and that's what I did and they accepted me and it was the greatest thing ever and I just that was I was fine with that. But when I say it took on a life of its own about the time when I was the opening act for MC Hammer. And that's when everything just went. I started seeing white people come to my shows more and more and then i seen blacks whites puerto ricans mexicans and every other everybody in the world started coming and i was just like wow this is not rap music cuz i've never looked at rap music as a color i'm not a white rapper by the way i'm a rapper you know you don't you don't label music with colors it's made for your ears not your eyes so I never compare anything or even think about that issue and it's never been an issue with me. I reflect in, in my the music that has influenced me. Yeah, but well, what I what I see with what you did is it's almost when when Tiger 
was an African-American golfer and you're like, wait a minute, now a Middle Eastern guy like me is interested in golf, I would have never paid attention to golf. You came in and in that time you got people that maybe never looked at hip hop because the yeah. biggest record prior to it was sold was who? Was it half a million records? Yep, it, half a million records was like Beastie Boys, Rum DMC, which was the biggest rap selling records of all time. And then, and then all of a sudden, my record sells 163 million. 163 still to this million. Day. And it's like 25, six years old right now. And last year, it sold 3.3 million. My first record, To the Extreme, sold 3.3 around the world last year. It's crazy how it just keeps going and going. But, uh, you know, I don't know how to explain things, but I, I, I think that uh, by analyzing it myself, um, I think that in a funny way that it, it's all connected to the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> you are I really the Ninja Turtle that. guy yourself. As funny as it sounds, <laughs> I, I think that because the generation of the Ninja Turtles is really huge, you know, it's like our age and then the kids today are still into it. So they can be like yes. cool to their kids, you know, like you like the Ninja Turtles, so did I, you know, and we have this bond and I'm connected forever. Uh, through Ke Kevin Eastman and all the uh, Ninja Turtles and everything, it's a culture, and it's it's huge and it goes around the world. People forget that that movie was big in Russia, it was big in Iran, it was big in Afghanistan, no and every place that you could imagine that you would never imagine, it's big there. And Ice Ice Baby also traveled through all those avenues and went through over every hurdle to get to to countries that have never considered listening to rap music, not just America, because the movement started in America and it opened up all demographics and it, it basically created a life of its own and became an anthem. And uh, I'm honored, man. I mean, because it reflects the 90s and the 90s was the last of the great decades. And the reason I say that is because of pop culture through music and fashion. If you think about it right now, they call it the lost generation because from 2000 to 2017, there's a gap of 17 years and they call it the lost generation because nothing defines it. Mm. And if you look back 100 years from now and you look at from 2000 to 2017, the only thing that defines it is computers and iPhone. iPhone came out in 2004, the laptop came out, computers. Yeah. And the computers were so big, and they still are right now, that nothing is, is making an impact with fashion right now. All my kids and every kid you see is wearing the same stuff from the 90s, high tops, neon colors, the same stuff we wore in the 90s. I mean, listen, we got our movies at Blockbuster, bro. Yes, we did, 2020 we, and Blockbuster. <laughs> we didn't have no 1080p or Snap crap or Instagram, right? We had flip phones, remember? We come from flip phones when simple life was simple and it was just like, oh, look at this, man, my phone flips. And you had to text like, you know, yes, 500 times tell. to get like the number seven to say an M or something, right? <laughs> It was ridiculous. I mean, and our time was pagers, right? Our time was uh, pagers, pagers came out, and, then and the cell brick phones. phones. You know, you got the, those big brick phones. Right, but but we come from a, you know, we, we used to dance. In the '90s, we danced. In the '90s was just such a great decade. It was the whole last big pop culture movement. You go in the mall today, you see everything '90s. They're they're coming out with the fanny pack again. Today we're gonna be going over the latest high beast trend. Everything there is to know about fanny packs. They wear Wayfair <laughs> glasses now. I'm like, uh, come on, man. They can't come up with anything new because how are you gonna wear a computer? How are you gonna wear the iPhone look? It doesn't make a pop culture impact. That's an interesting point music you're making. Music makes pop culture impact because music affects people through their through their memory. Yeah. You can play a song no matter how old it is, and you'll remember something, when that song comes on, you'll remember who you were dating in high school, right. what kind of clothes or shoes yes. you had, you'll know what kind of car you drove. There, there are certain songs that make you happy instantly. I think about Will Smith, you know, Summertime. You know how yeah. that song comes in, you just kind of go in yeah. a good mood. Monel Jordan, this is how we do it. And then yes. no matter when you play Ice Ice, maybe there's something that happens to you and everybody kind of goes, yeah, it triggers something. So, so, so this happens, you go, you're selling a million records a day, it's yep. on fire, and then all of a sudden you're getting some controversy that's coming out. You got the gig with uh, 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 Arsenio Hall that he's going on there, and that was kind of an interesting interview, the way it was done, and afterwards he says he had a bad day that day and he got pressured because he had some misinformation, so he was upset at you, right. whatever was going on there. So t tell me about the next part, because here you are, you're everywhere, magazine, cover of magazine, TV, news, concerts, and then boom,
here comes David Bowie, Queen, you know, under pressure. H how did that go about? Well, you know, when you're pushing down walls and breaking down barriers and jumping over hurdles and you're selling more records than anybody in the world, people are going to come at you from every angle to try to get the money or try to cause, you know, uh, conflict or looking for stories to create ratings and, and all kinds of things. So they, they, they create all this stories and all this media hype around me because I'm the center of attention. So when you're the center of attention and the world would rather hear, you know, more negative stuff than positive. No doubt. That's so the media. it just kind of it takes on a life of its own. For me, I was young. I didn't know any different. I just rode the wave. And the way I look at it is it's like a snow globe. It gets shaken up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this thing is just all over the place. I've read so many different stories about me. I don't even know what to believe. But uh, it's, it's amazing how you can leave such an impact that people have all these different opinions and conversations about you, you know, and... Um, but what's the truth? What happened there with uh, the, the Under Pressure song, right? Because oh, Under Pressure whole... was basically a sampling. I sampled the Under Pressure song, uh, David Bowie and Queen. We had to convince this guy that we were going <laughs> to go places and do things to give us some studio time because we couldn't afford it. We were broke. And uh, he goes, oh, I don't know about this. It's expensive to make a record, you know, not like today where everybody's got a home studio. So we convinced him, you know, I, I must have busted a rhyme to him or something. I gave him a rhyme and he was just like, wow, that's pretty cool, you know, and go ahead, go in my, use my studio this late night, valid. you know, so we got to work uh, for, till, you know, six every day. And after that, you can come in at night and do your thing. Boom. I put it in there, man. I, I, lay, I made the whole record to the extreme. And yeah, I sold a million records a day. Uh, this thing came out. I went on tour and then I went on my own world tour. Uh, through America first, you know, and then and then when I when they said you're going to Europe, you're going to London, and you're playing Wembley Arena, sold out, you know, and now we're going to Russia, and I'm started like what? And now you're going to everywhere in the world, from in, to Indonesia to China to Asia, everywhere you could hit on the entire world, and I'm like, this is rap music. Do these people know this? Nope, but they will now. They know your song. And I go to Germany and I, and I meet these, these kids who are speaking broken English and they say, I learned to speak English on your song. What is a gauge and a nine? <laughs> Some of the words with the slang they yes. didn't understand, you know. But they, they, they rehearsed it and they learned it through the music and I was just so, so fascinated by this because I never knew the impact of what I wrote down sitting in my living room right there, you know, would ever make that big of an impact. And boom. So I get, I get samples. Uh, since my record was really blowing up, uh, they came at me at, with a lawsuit, obviously, for sample clearances. Sure. I didn't clear any samples. You know, I just did the same thing that had been done way before I came along in rap music. But the difference very is... Very common. Very common. I mean, I didn't invent sampling. That's a part of rap music. Sure. Still is today. Still today. They, they do it today. I yep. mean, Puff Daddy all the gets time. away with it for all the heat that I took from it. What happened was is that, you know, everybody who did it before me wasn't getting sued because they didn't sell any records to get sued. So a lawyer says there's no money there. Who cares? Whether it's the Beastie Boys or Run DMC or whatever, it didn't matter. And now that I'm selling a million records a day, they're like, this is money. This is sampling. So, you know, they went after it. So they opened up an entire building in New York City called Sample Clearances. An entire building, 100 floors. And I was like, just because of me, just because of the impact of my record. And uh, so, yeah, I went through a lawsuit and instead of, uh, you know, going through court and everything, I settled the thing, you know, and I ended up buying a, a buying the song. So I, I actually own um, a good portion of uh, Under Pressure. So Under Pressure is my song and Ice Ice Baby is my song. So you own a portion of Under Pressure. Oh, so yeah. every time Under Pressure is in a movie, yep. you're getting a check. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. So Under Pressure was in the cartoon Sing, and it was <laughs> in the movie Girl Next Door. It don't matter. It that don't matter. Ice you're Ice Baby. Checks. Either way, I'm getting checks. Unbelievable. So I learned about publishing by that, you know, because Michael Jackson owns the Beatles publishing yep. and all that. So I bought some of my publishing back and trying to put a whole catalog together. It's not easy to buy publishing, but uh, that's the real money. That's where it's at, you know? So here's my question for you next, because, okay, sampling, so what? The controversy was that. Then the controversy was, you know, is this guy a real tough guy? Is he not a tough guy? Okay, no problem. I mean, they've said 
Did 50 get shot nine, nine times? Did this guy get shot up? Did DMX do this? This is very common controversy that happens. But at that time when it happened to you, it seems like you were the first guy where they went to with uh, 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 this side of the story, right? So my questioning would be, my thought process is, how different would it have been if 1990 was 2017 with access to today's social media? Think about oh, it. Oh yeah, for if sure. If Vanilla Ice came out today in 2017, how many followers would you have had on Instagram? How many on Twitter? How many on, you know, Snap? And, yeah, you know, yeah, all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, would that have uh, 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 allowed for your career to continuously, continuously grow, or would it have been what happened to you back in the days, in 1990, 1991? That's it what I think been, about sometimes with your It would have been a, a huge impact either way, because a great song is a great song, and you could release it that song today. It would have been today, a huge impact, no matter which way it, it's released. That I song wonder if it is, would have been even bigger. It all starts off with the song. It, people can analyze it in so many ways that it becomes confusing and complicated and it's really it's not rocket science it's more simple than that the honest truth behind it is a great song is a great song no matter who wrote it or what it is or how it came from or anything about it but the 90s had such a movement you know before social media and everything so people really believed some of these rumors like NWA they really thought they were gangster I did I was opening up for him and when Easy E came down the hallway I stood up against the wall go shh here he comes. Here he comes. Hi. <laughs> I was scared of them because I really thought they were doing drive-bys and you know and all this stuff. But later on, we find out, you know, because you know I, I knew personally, first of all, because of the Suge Knight thing, because of all the the you know I, I contributed to two. Now Suge Knight was so huh? Suge Knight may have been a gangster guy, but yes, maybe but, not but, easy. But the musicians some... were not so Got gangster it. like people think, yeah. so they called them studio gangsters, you know. Of course, because it, if they really would would advertise that on a record, they wouldn't be very smart, would they? And they'd go to prison right away. You'd be like, oh, you just told everybody you murdered people. Well, well, let's investigate you from the FBI. Oh, you did? Let's go to prison. So, like Bobby Schmurder, he actually said it, he wrote about it, and he did it, and now he's in prison. You can't do that. So the studio gangster thing came out in the 90s. You have some people who dibbed and dabbed in, in the streets mm -hmm. who lived around it, so they wrote about that. Yeah. And that's kind of what happened. They were more, more like reporters of it, but they would ref, it, they, when they reflected it through their music, you would think that they were the ones actually doing it. Like Ice-T was one of the originators of it, you know? And I know he's seen some gangster stuff around the streets because we all know Compton and Watts and we know the streets that they all grew up in, but I don't think they were the ones that were actually physically doing it. And I know all of them anyway. And I knew Tupac when he, when he had a little high top fade and, and he was really friendly, you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden he started getting more into the streets and reflecting kind of what he saw in his environment mm. growing up. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he became, like a reporter, so to speak, to his communities and his environment and stuff that he's seen through his life. And people could read that through his music. He's a genius at it, all of them were. So, so I look at it from the outsider as a, as a fan, right? Obviously I'm not in that world, I look at it as a fan. Tupac died in 96, I'm class of 96. So I grew up, yep. you know, uh, in this side and in LA. And so what I look at on your strengths is you guys are very creative. Your brain goes a million miles a minute. Like I just asked you right now, are you OCD? When I looked at your garage, yeah. like this guy's a super organized guy the way you are. And you said, yes, I'm super OCD and it helps you on the real estate side. Yep. Is there a part of it that you think where you guys, uh, when I say you guys, I categorize a creative community. You can adapt to new trends, which could be where you came out with your music that you had and then your second album that you came out with was a complete shift of what your original one was. And that one didn't work out as good as the first one. You think there was a part of it where you felt like the, the marketplace was telling you ice, shift, Rob, you gotta shift, you gotta change and to go to this. Do you think that's what it was or do you think it was just? I'm I don't care about all that stuff. I never think about outside influence. I write my music the way I write it. I've had people try to pressure me to make new records and do things and I won't do it. It's more like a, to me, it, I hold it more sacred. It's more like a diary. And I'll write my diary when I feel damn good and well to write it. And I'll do it the way I want to do it. And I'll reflect it the way I want to do it. Everybody wants to come in and try to take over the wheel and steer you in this direction or this direction. Is that how it was where you were going through when and everybody I, was when giving I, you? When I started off, when, I, when it blew up, I, I, I trusted these record companies and everything. And they created these things called bios. I didn't even know what the word bio meant. 
I thought it was Biodome, the movie, you yeah. know? <laughs> I didn't know anything about this Polly stuff. Shore, Biodome. Yeah, I didn't know. I'm, I was only a kid. So I look at it like it's a snow globe and it was all shaken up, but uh, it, was, it was definitely such a, an impact that it, it really was confusing to me more than anybody because I was just like, wow. The impact of them trying to change you or trying yeah. to direct you? They tried to change me with uh, bios that they wrote up because they wanted to clean up my act because now I'm catering to a younger audience. That's and what the I kids. was saying, yeah. So, so they, they created this image uh, of how I look, how I dress, and you know, try to turn me in almost to like a teen star. And they did, actually. I was on all teen magazines and everything, too. Because I had such an impact of a broad-scale audience for rap music, they've never had this happen before. Right. So there was nobody before me. I have the first hip-hop song to ever go number one on Pop Station. First ever. And it's, it's, it was just uncharted territory. So what happened is, is that um, you know, Eminem can use my career as a guideline on what to do, what not to do, but nobody could, I, could, I didn't have anybody to look at That's before right. me. So I, I trusted these people just to, they're the record company. They must know what they're doing. I'm selling a million records a day. My bank account is huge. Go ahead. What are we doing next? <laughs> I, I became a puppet. That's exactly what I was asking that. So And I didn't want to be a puppet after I realized some of the consequences of being a puppet. I was like, wait a minute. Is this, is this, so what happened is, is this snow globe kind of settled. And then I realized that... It was artificial. Almost everything is artificial. In fact, all of the uh, music industry, to me, I, I started to get a real good focus on it. Not what the public sees, but what, what, what I see as an inside person living it. Right. Uh, it came in focus, and it became artificial. Like, it's not a real world. Like, you think of Justin Bieber, you know? He goes around, he pees on old men off bridges, he drives Lamborghini and does drugs and whatever he does, you know? And you hear all these stories. And nobody cares about his new record at the time. They care more about, you know, uh, TMZ and, and what he's doing, uh, you know, with crazy stuff and how he basically self-destructs. So people were focusing now on how Vanilla Ice is going to self-destruct all this huge fame and, and, and all this stuff, you know. So how's it going to collapse? Oh, my God, I'm interested now. So talk about that. So now all that pressure is on you. Yeah. Everybody's preparing for you to collapse. Yeah. You don't have like a Eminem had a Dre or 50 had an Eminem no. or, you know, somebody has a mentor that's giving them direction. You're mm. just kind of coming out by yourself out of I'm Dallas. All alone, man. And you're making this work. What the hell are you thinking at this time? Like, how are you processing this? I was scatterbrained. And, and that's what I was saying. So what happened is, is that I had a weekend that lasted about three years. <laughs> and then it, and then a snow globe settled. And then I figured it out. You know what? Here's the truth. All this, the, the red carpets, the, the screaming fans, the traveling everywhere is all artificial. And then there's the real me. There's me. So the media, the fame, everything is artificial. It's not real. Uh, it's a part of my life because that's my career, my job now. Uh, but it was really just a passion. It, I didn't think of, I got a job? I got a career, I'm gonna make money doing this. I never did it initially to make any money or have any fame. It wasn't my purpose or my drive. My drive was to create a diary and write some songs uh, using poetry to just basically reflect everything of my environment that I've seen in my life and grew up, you know, my life. It wasn't ever meant to be what it was and it took on a life of its own. And when that happened, I'm the only one that's on the wave and that wave was so big it was like a freaking tsunami and I'm surfing that thing man and I'm surfing it all the way and as you know and I know every wave has to hit the shore so that wave hits the shore and crashes and most people right there is where all the cameras come over when you hit yep. the shore and they go whoa he's self-destructing what's he gonna do turn to drugs suicide join the 27 club where are we going now let's see all eyes on this Let's throw darts at him. Let's say this and that. He's just a product on the shelf. We pull off and we'll use him for ratings, you know? Let's polish up the Suge Knight story. Oh, he hung him over a balcony now. Oh, really? Okay. Um, you know, crazy stuff just comes out. So I learned how to differentiate that there's a real person still in here, and I had to find that real person. And I had to separate it from that artificial thing. And it was basically going back to motocross racing and hanging out with my real people. And, you know, it was one of the greatest things ever. And I learned how to, you know, and then I had a family and I've created my family and my kids. And then I realized that we are all the same around this entire world. We're all one. And once I became this super positive person, I became who I am. And I love spreading positivity because I believe this is, this is it, man. This is all we get. 
We go from start to finish. Make it the best. Don't take anything too serious. Smile more through life. I don't care if it's economy, religion, your job, your family, your relationship. Don't take anything too serious, including yourself. Enjoy life, guys. Man, when we die, game over. Make it a game. Make it fun. Once you find a purpose that's better to live for than yourself, then you'll realize that's the meaning of life is to have family and friends because I don't care what you have, how much fame you have, how much money you have. You could be driving all the Bugattis, Ferraris, everything you want. If you're alone, you'll trade it at all of it for you know some green stamps and a family and friends because the family and friends are going to treat you a lot better than your money and your fame is. And they're going to be real with you and they're going to give you more happiness, more smiles, more love, more, more life than any of the rest of it. So it's, it was a lesson that was, you know, taught to me through basically consequences of life. So, so that's, that's, that's interesting. It's great to see where you're at right now with the project you're working on, but a couple questions while you were going through your career, any, any unique Tupac stories or experiences you have that maybe people haven't heard from your point of view, because you hear these stories with Tupac and you hear <laughs> the guy had so many multiple personalities. One minute he could be a happy guy. One minute he's talking about revolution. One minute he wants to go out there and be a player. One minute he's got a temper. Who was Tupac to you when you, you had an experience with him? Well, I know Tupac. I knew him well, and he was a great guy. Very, very welcoming. He had a big heart, a big heart. And the greatest thing about him was his talent. He didn't even really know he had the talent that he had. He had a way of absorbing everything that he would see through life, whether he lived it or not he would absorb it and then he had the talent to bring it up somehow in a subconscious while he was in some sort of environment a lab we call it maybe up in the mountains in Malibu who knows where he wrote you know but somewhere a Zen moment like a writer would you know hibernate somewhere Tupac had a way of taking all of the absorption and all of it and putting it into song forms which were poetry His, he was a poet and that's, I don't even think he knew what a great poet he, he really was. And a lot of people can have those influences and, and they just, they come in and they see things that happen to them, but they don't have a way to absorb it to where it comes out in their subconscious when they're writing. And I think he could tap into anything at any creative time, whatever he was thinking about, and write about it in, in a creative way, in an entertaining way. And if he was sitting there talking or thinking about how he got here and being respectful to having money and fame, he would go into his mom and he would talk about his mom and he would write about his mother, Dear Mama. I can still get goosebumps listening to that song today. Every time. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So he had that talent, man, that he didn't even know he had. For me, I gotta, I gotta really tap into that creative juice. You know, I, I can't, that's why I won't just go make a record for the sake of making a record. Let's block some studio time. I'm going in to make a record. It becomes artificial at that time. For me, I wanna make it a chapter of my life. I wanna make it a part of something you can really look at it and say, and feel where I was at at that time. You know, you tap into those emotions. And that's the greatest thing about music is that if you can, you let your emotions out through your records, they become less artificial and more real, and people relate to it a lot more. I did a, song, a record called Hard to Swallow, and it was my therapeutical record. I did it with Ross Robinson, produced Corn, Limp Biscuit, and all these great acts. It needed to be this for me, and it wasn't because I was trying to do rock music or any kind of other thing than being orchestrated by this type of music because yeah. of what had happened in my life. Ross Robinson came to me. I didn't come to him. I didn't search this direction out and I didn't think it would sell 10 copies and it ended up selling 5 million copies underground with no promotion no MTV videos no social media just word of mouth oh my god did you hear this vanilla ice record they would play it for people and, and I remember hearing stories of people say I'm gonna put this CD in and I'm gonna jam this thing and I'm gonna crank it up now you tell me if you know who this is and they never could guess it and they said, I don't know who it is, but it's freaking awesome. Let's hear it again. And then they'd say, that's Vanilla Ice. And they'd be like, get the hell out of here. That is not Vanilla Ice. And it is because of all the things that have happened in my life, you know, they were trapped in me and I needed to get those demons out. And so the orchestration of every dark thing that had ever happened in my life needed that kind of orchestration behind me to release, to release it 
and to make it real and, and fit. And, and that record is the most realest record I've ever wrote. To you? To me. Wow. Because it was a diary, man, and I got those demons out. And ever since I made that record, I've been happy. Do you listen to your own music? Like, do you sit I, there? I listen to some of my music, but some of it, like that record, I can't listen to it. I to won't deep. listen to it. I won't. Because I, I re-tap into some negative thoughts that have happened in my life that I don't want to relive. So I got them out. I don't want them back. You know what I mean? So if I listen to that, I will start thinking about where I was at in that time. I have a song on there called Scars. I don't want to hear it. I have a song called ADD. I don't want to hear it. It makes me depressed, and I was depressed at that time. And that's when why you wrote it, you were depressed. I was depressed. Got it. And I don't want to be that. I'm so happy now because I got it out of me, and that was a therapeutical record, and I never thought music could be so therapeutical. I thought music was meant to make people dance and be happy and be fun. But with my music, you know, I always took it so serious. And then, you know, with the image and the, and the record company taking over with everything, making it cater to a younger audience and fitting kids and demographics and everything, it kind of overpowered some of the words in the music. But if you listen to all my music, I tell stories. I'm not a rapper that goes out and goes, hey, pump it up, pump it up, go, go, get it, get it, let's dance, dance, dance. And I'm really, you know, and some of those songs are good, just if you want to dance and stuff. But If you listen to my music, it really does tell stories. Every single one of them. You know, if you listen to Ice Ice Baby, it's a story from start to finish. Rolling mm -hmm. in my 5.0, rag top down so my hair can blow, shade with the gauge, vanilla with the nine, you know, eight ball. <laughs> That's cocaine, man. That's not for an eight year old kid. So the image overpowered it. Gauge is a 12 gauge, nine is a nine millimeter. <laughs> I'm sitting here dancing and singing like it's the like I'm Justin Bieber all of a sudden. And so in teen magazines and I'm going, does anybody listen to the words? <laughs> wow. So it took on a life of its own uh, that even uh. surprised me. I'm like, wow, I was never geared up to be any of this. I was never put in a position to say, let's practice before you do this. Or I was just thrown out there like a piece of meat to a pack of wolves. And let's see what comes out And let's it. see what comes yeah. out. So you transitioned from the when I asked about Tupac and the fact that he was a storyteller, that you are also kind of a storyteller yourself. Was, was there a, a moment with Tupac that you yourself would cherish forever? Did you guys have a moment where you say, this was one moment, one conversation I had with him that I will forever remember this? Yeah, he's, he's very, he's got a lot of wisdom and he actually, he gave me some wisdom some things that I don't feel like talking about, honestly. Uh, they're personal to me, and I'll hold them dearly forever. Great guy, he uh, gave me some wisdom, but I also, what, was, what made him real cool to me was that he says, he says I gave him some wisdom, you know? These are some personal things that would stir up a lot of controversy out there, so I'm gonna keep them to myself because they're personal, but uh, that's exactly what they were meant to be, personal. It was me and him in a con in conversation that, uh, that was brief, but, but very impactful to my life and the, the direction I decided to go and who I became. So I have a lot of influence myself, you know what I mean? And it wasn't his music that influenced me. I mean, even though he was super talented, but it was more of the, the people, you know? Uh, there's been other people along the way, you know. When Tupac passed, you know, what were you thinking? Were you kind of in the mix where, because, you know, Kid Frost has his own opinions on what happened and, you know, uh, Cube, you know, Snoop, a lot of guys have their own opinion. Were you in the mix to kind of have some idea of what happened or you had no idea? Listen, nobody would ever expect Vanilla Ice to be in such of the gangster mix, but yes, I was right in the middle of it. I mean, I, when I saw the NWA movie, I saw the part right where I was kind of inserted. I saw, I knew them because I was their opening act yeah. and I seen the whole NWA movement and everything. And then, and then I knew when Suge Knight came in and I knew when, when you see, I, you know that before there was Tupac, the Chronic Record and Snoop Dogg, that was the insertion of Vanilla Ice in the Suge Knight thing. Because the money that basically he took uh, went to Finance these finance guys. these guys, Got and it. and by doing that, I I was never bitter. I, I was like, wow! I just contributed to some of the greatest hip hop music ever invented, ever. The Chronic Record, history, man, that's historical. Wow. Tupac, historical. Snoop Dogg, historical. They all knew it. 
all of them knew it. Everyone knew where it went and how and how it, it came. about three to four million, right? That you got from you, some somewhere four. on that. More, more, four, and still going because it, he got points off the record. So is he getting it or is the other guy getting it? Who's getting the points? Yeah, they, 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 he. He is getting it, of course. You got to come back to him. <laughs> that so records, what happened man, to but... Tupac, based on what you think? Do you kind of, is there a way you lean towards saying, this is the person I got Tupac? Because some say it was a blood and crip thing, so crip got. Is there anything that you say who got Tupac? Do you have an idea? Ha, I got every bit of idea, and I will not say a word, man. <laughs> you, you're not going to get me there, bro. You can ask me whatever you want, but I, I will hold that one to my grave, brother. Well, I mean, it's been Can't asked it. multiple times, and it, it comes yeah. back to the same guy's name, but uh, it, yeah, it seems yeah. like it's a pretty fear. You probably feared... got a pretty good idea. Okay, well, Let me enough. just tell well, you this. What you read on, on Google, I mean, it, or on, on the Internet is... is confusing but i think there's been a lot of years go by and it's it's always going to be like the jfk thing it's always going to be until you have the actual per person there and you've really locked it down and the case is closed yeah. it's going to be a conspiracy to the end of time the good thing is there was a lot of people that witnessed it that give their own views the cousin you know i think mm. the cousin's right now making a movie about it mm. and he's trying to give his perspective there's so many people close to it that can give you enough ideas Let me to just see say what this. happened there. there's a lot of people that could tell you i doubt any of them really will and if you find one that will more power to you man hope he's still alive the next day <laughs> i don't know uh there's certain things that that should stay private you know and, and this is one you think this is one of you, think, you don't think the public the fans need to know this i think they can go find it pretty much online there's a they've got pretty good stories online yeah some of the avenues are, are artificial and and and, and not the right direction got it but i will say this the truth is out there online already that's it I'm not gonna tell you which one it is anything i'm not saying anything further but it, it is there it is there okay so um you've had some wild experiences in your life man i mean you were barbie at one point which is you know yeah. not many people can say they, they had a bar i laugh about it today <laughs> man i got those dolls <laughs> i love them man i collect them now how do your kids feel about it when they say my, my dad, kids yeah. think i'm so cool that's like cooler great. than i think i am that's the, that's the best <laughs> thing so you, you so you had you had you know the whole barbie doll thing i think you know, you were a top motocross guy that was competitive. You got a bunch of trophies on the other side there in your uh, garage. I think in one point in 1994, you were ranked, what, number six jet skier in, in the, the world. world. You know, yeah. you did poetry, you dated Madonna. You, you, I mean, you had some, you had a life. What, 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 had, what? that's past tense. I have the greatest life now you have because, a happy of, life. because you have a, of what has all happened. The experiences you had, what was the, what's the craziest experience you've had? Oh, a my person goodness. like you. Give me really? the wildest, craziest experience. Oh, it doesn't, I don't even have to blink. I can tell you right now. I had this girl that was, uh, I guess, from a satanic church because my birthday's on Halloween. Follow my tour around. She had a black trench coat on. She was naked underneath. She was in front of every concert and she would flash me. And my dancers and all, we'd be like, wow, this is cool. We were just kids dancing, you know? And uh, we didn't Seriously. think much about it. And this girl, uh, I hear this commotion on the airplane on my way to uh, Japan. And uh, I turn around, and they have this girl tackled on the, you know, uh, in the jet back, you know, about three rows back. And I was just like, wow! She was screaming and trying to get to me. And I had my bodyguards, you know, at the time. They, I was thinking it was another crazy fan. I get off the plane. They come in, arrest her. Uh, I'm at, I'm there for a week and a half in Japan, and in my hotel room, I get a knock on the door. No one's there. I open the door. There's a, a satanic Bible with a message written to me in the, in the book. I, I pick it up. I drop it. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, the next night, same thing, about 2 a.m., another book, another story, no one at the door. And then the night, the next third night, I just switched uh, rooms. I told my whole, because I had the whole floor, 52 people on my payroll at the time, so I had the, uh, the whole floor. And I uh, switched rooms with my road manager, John Bush. And he goes in there and he, he, he gets the, he's waiting by the door, just up all night, nodding off, but sitting by the door. The knock happens. Uh, we had some uh, security guards at the uh, elevator. He opens up the door and he sees this girl running down the hallway, bashing out the lights down the hallway. There's glass everywhere. And he goes, hey guys, stop that girl. And then he, he, they stop her from the elevator. So she, she came up the fire escape because she couldn't get up the elevator. They wouldn't let anybody on the floor. She climbed up that outside of the building fire escape and came in and uh, they trapped her in the hallway. We went out there and she was in the in the hallway and she's like, crying really bad you know a pretty girl 
and crying and just, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do this. I didn't mean any of this. And everybody backed up and, you can't have him. He's my destiny. And she goes, ah, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I don't know why I do that. And then we were all freaking out, man. We were like, what the f is going on with this girl, man? Our hair was standing up on our back and I, we were like, hoo, hoo, hoo. and then she would snap in and out of this character, you know, and, and, uh, John Bush is over there and he's like trying to, I, from the movies, I guess he saw, you know, he figured he would kind of put his hand over her head and pray. And she was trying to bite him. Arr, arr. She would say, he would say, what are you doing here? And why are you doing this? And I don't mean to do this. I'm so sorry. This is not me. I don't want to. He's my destiny. I must have him. And all these crazy things and noises were coming out of this girl. And we would, we were just free. I was way back in the back, man. I was tripping and she could see me through everybody and look at me when she meant this. She was from Ireland or something in Satanic wow. Church. And she was coming after me to, I guess, convert me because I'm born on Halloween which is, I guess, their holiday or whatever. Who knows? But he took her down the elevator, and they, before they arrested her, they interrogated her. They talked to her and asked her why and what. She was a mental case, man. They're out there. Unbelievable. There is mental people out there. And I had nightmares for years. I On the jet ski tour, I punched my buddy in the face. We were all sharing the room. We had four guys in a room, and I jumped over in the middle of my sleep of the nightmare and punched him in the face, and he punched me back. And I go, why'd you hit me? He goes, look at you, bro. He had a bl bloody nose. And I was over there and I had dragged him with the sheets off his bed and I had thrown him up against the window and I'm like, I did that? He goes, yeah, are you crazy? You, what's going on? I go, bro, I just had my first nightmare. I didn't think I could have a nightmare. And I, and I thought this girl was coming. I had this crazy dreams, man. And I had woke up, but still asleep and dragged him out and started beating my, my friend up thinking it was some kind of crazy girl or something. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's we didn't know so what really happened. I didn't even know why he punched me, and here I am, oh and I had to stop. Goodness. I woke up, and I looked around, and I said, I did all that. He goes, look at his room. You made a mess. <laughs> I didn't know I could have a nightmare, and I had a nightmare like that, a living nightmare where I actually acted it out. Weird. That's that, the craziest that is thing that ever I mean, happened that, That's what, that's 26 years ago? That's, yeah. that's like early 90s? Yeah. On? <laughs> It's like, reminds me of the movie Exorcist, right? I know. What I don't even believe in that stuff, and yet here it is happening. Wow. This is all the, this is from motocross. Yeah, but this is just a few of them. This is how I became competitive, because my dad told me, he says, listen, you just came in fifth place. And I come in, he goes, that's because you were at your girlfriend's house all night and you didn't practice all during the week. He goes, do you want to settle for fifth place? You got more talent and more speed than the guys that just beat you. You let them beat you. Wow. I go, I was trying. He goes, I don't want to hear that. You didn't try hard enough. He goes, I said, wow. I went out, I told my girlfriend, I said, I can't come over tonight. I can't <laughs> come over, I can't come over. <sighs> Every day after high school, or school, just regular school, I was practice, 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 practice. I get out there that weekend, every guy that beat me, I won. I started winning, he was right. Well, he had high expectations. Beat it. And he did it, he pushed me, man, into a-, a but, but from a love standpoint. A love, all love, all love. Uh, I built all of this whole house, from all the ceiling applications to the fiber optic lights. Uh, if you wanna you know, convert the room over uh, and shut it, you'll see that everything all is motorized. So even your windows turn into movie posters, your drapes, everything shuts. Get out of it. The windows turn into movie posters. And you're going to love the movie posters too. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> I'm assuming teenage, that's right. <laughs> you want to see a cool toilet? We put these fancy things in, and this is already a few years old, right? No, most people have nothing to show about a toilet, but this thing plays Bluetooth. It's got oscillating, pulsating, front cleansing, I mean, I think it's a sex toy, honestly. <laughs> Where do you keep your exotics? Where do you keep some of your cars? Uh, I got a couple of them here. I've got uh, other houses, all my garages. I know you said you're building a 200 car garage. Which oh is... yeah, I, I collect old cars and uh, all cars actually. So and Rob, how did, you, how did you keep your money? How I went to work. A lot of guys. You know how you keep your money is you never stop working. Good point. 
You know, you don't just make a bunch of money and go, oh, I can retire or I can stop because your bills don't stop. <laughs> they always accumulate and they yeah. get even bigger as time goes. So you just don't stop working, man. Work, work, just work, work. Concept. Get up and go to work. This is some technology I found that's really cool. This could solve world hunger. This has, this is, this is, uh, it makes water out of air. So you call it drinkable air. And this is one of the new things I'm, I'm uh, showcasing this season. Drinkable air. Show. Yes. Can I have a cup? Absolutely. It's delicious. Made out of air. There's no water jug. There's no water feed that puts water into this. It takes humidity and makes water. And it's cold. It's cold, it's purified, and it's delicious. Anybody else want some? So I got hit by Hurricane Andrew. I lost a lot of these. I had tons of them. But if you look here. The cassette tape. This one here is, this is how it works. This is platinum, which means a million records. One million sold. So you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And then you got over here, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. There's 20 million, 25 million, six, seven. You went six times platinum in Australia, there's like 30 something million. Here's another 10 million, that's 50 million. How many, you said 50 million so This long? is 50 I'm showing you, certified right here, but it's 163 million. Oh, wow. First record? First one. This is the one that sold 40,000? Ichiban Records right there. Wow. Yeah, that's it right there. The only painting in the world of her like that. The only painting in the world of her like that. It. Go ninja, go, go ninja, go. There you go. go, ninja, go. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's not gonna stop. Never gonna that's stop. That's gonna continue forever. Who would have thought the Ninja Turtles would continue forever? Yeah, so I love this location and you can see it feels like we're in the country. I have all this land that I can do whatever I want with. Nobody bother me, it's so total private. And I love it over here at the compound. Now the ocean house is cool, got a boat and hang out there, but this is the compound. You know what I mean? Like this, I can this come over here and play. This also kind of gives you a taste of Texas. Like it, 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 I got it Texas almost, almost you got there, Texas right? on this and side. And I'm in the middle of billionaire row here. <laughs> and this is going to be a 200 car garage all right here. Air conditioned, all this. You're saying you're going to finish this by May? Yes. The whole thing? Yep. I just built a house on the ocean, three acres over here. Not one person believed it except for my crew. We work like ants on a candy bar, bro. We do not <laughs> We get after it, man. Tell us about the Vanilla Ice Project because it, you mean, you know, you, you've, been, you've been doing some uh, uh, real cool stories here. I mean, people are saying, well, I didn't know he had this side. Yeah, I didn't know he had the real estate side. And then a lot of people don't know that for 20 years, apparently, you've been, you've been doing this, you've been practicing this, you've been learning this. And now that whole noise behind us, that's a project you're working on. Right. Apparently, she's saying May 1st is the timeline. Oh, that yeah, we'll hoping. get it done. So tell us how this came about with the Vanilla Ice Project. Well, the TV show I never really wanted. I didn't even think about a TV show. I didn't pitch this. I didn't have this idea. This was Matt Levine out of New York. But the way it worked out was the TV show is um, I've been, do been doing real estate for over 23 years. Uh, I worked my way up from small homes to middle-sized homes to the huge mansions you see me doing now. So just a lot of hard work, you know, getting up early and making things happen. And, uh, you know, that's, that's them drilling that's right them now. Drilling, They're cutting through yeah. concrete. I went to design school 18 years ago and I found a passion that I never thought you could find. I didn't even expect it or predict it. I didn't, you know, when I was doing Ice Ice Baby, I could never say, where are you going to be, you know, 20 years down the line? I never could envision this. So that even shows me to expect the unexpected. You know, and life is going to take you curves no matter how you plan it. And we all try to set goals and stuff. But if you meet someone, a relationship that can take you off in a different direction or a job that can take you in a different direction. There's so many things that can sure. happen. Yep. So I expect the unexpected. So I found a passion that I never thought I would find. And I love it so much. I can't even tell you, man. And I get the same artistic fulfillment out of that as I do through music. You know, I, I really get to re reflect. I put my signature on all my homes. I define my homes into custom homes that are different than, than anything else in the neighborhoods. Uh, I've, I've made great money doing this, but it's not for the money. For me, it's, it's, it's art. And it's just like the music, it's art. And, and I, I create art and I have a hard time selling them because I can become attached to them, you know? I keep half of the homes and people are like, what are you doing with this home? Nobody's living in it. And I go, I know, I know. What are you gonna do? Why don't you sell it? And he goes, hmm, hmm. And you, you know, you think of like Van Gogh, he didn't wanna sell his paintings. None of them were for sale until after he died. 
Uh, this is one that I built, you know, and I, I, we were having the Super Bowl party here last night and we had this place, you know, with a lot of people here and we were talking about, you know, all my guys have been with me for over 20 years. My concrete guys, my drywall guys, my framers. Your roofers. entire team's been with you for 20 years. 20 years. years. Wow. They're my great friends. They all come from that motocross. That says a lot about you, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank that you. says a lot about you because if you can keep a team together for that long, yep. they've seen the good, the bad, the ugly yep. of uh, whoever it is you're in business with. Oh, yeah. Very impressive. And thank you, and 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 that's it. I think building a strong team uh, is is essential, you know. And I do now. I do speeches and stuff like this to uh, people who want to get into real estate or want to just build a, a company, even any kind of company, and how you can find success in building any kind of company. And I and I and I pride myself on you know what I've learned throughout the years, and uh, I've learned a lot, you know. I, I I know how to build a really strong team. You know, there's thinkers, relators, socializers, and directors in this world. And, you know, a socializer like myself and a director like myself can't really do the thinker and the relator thing, which is sit in a cubicle, answer and organize all the paperwork. I have to get up and get out and get in the world and walk in a room and come up with the creative ideas. But I need those people because I can't do it without them. So if I build my team and place people in the right position by basically be becoming a good judge of character on what type of person they are, they are, they're happy because my girl Angela, she's happy in the cubicle. I couldn't stand it. She loves organizing and doing file work and paperwork and all office work and all this stuff that I can't do. I can, but I have to force myself to do it. I don't have a thrill. She loves it. So I put her there. She loves doing that. My buddy Wes Kane, he's the guy that's always working really hard. He's my you know co-star on the TV show with me. He's a socializer, man. He's loud and proud and you know couldn't put him in a cubicle. <laughs> he's lost. So he would be as lost as if I put Angela in his position. So I know how to position people to build a successful team. And I know, you know, there's a lot of uh, aspects there. And, um, and I learned how to do real estate on my own by reading books by Robert Sheeman, by going to Borders and, 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 and sitting late nights with a cup of coffee and, and just kind of educating myself. And Were you always like that, or did that? Is it post? Well, I didn't ice, know ice. how to learn anything, so I said, "Let me just learn it through books." And so I went to. I like coffee. I go up there. I sit down by myself. I'll pull some books off the shelf, and I'll sit down and, and educate myself. And and I and so I started getting into the investment side of real estate, because I, I definitely love the creative side, and the artistic side. So basically, I'm a builder designer. So I design the interior design as well as build the entire house. Got it. Most of those are two separate people. You have an architect that's gonna come in and build the house and that's just your frame and then you, you, your walls are there and they're all blank and then your, your designer comes in and puts all the candy or the jewelry or the chrome or you know, all the cosmetics to it. I do all of that, both of them. I have a, a thrill for doing that. And then I, I started getting into, because I used to pay these designers lots of money and I would follow them around and kind of intern. And I said, oh, so that's how you do it. And then I started looking at dollars and cents and I said, you know what? I'm paying you guys a lot of money. And yes, I'm making a profit, but I could make a bigger profit if I excluded you guys and did what you're doing myself. Now everybody thinks they can become a designer if they have money, but you can't. Let me tell you right now, I thought I could until I went to design school. And then I learned that, oh my gosh, everybody thinks they're a designer, but they're not. You know what I mean? So it's got to be kind of part of your it's DNA because it's a you creative. You have to learn about different yeah. different themes and different, you know, from transitional to contemporary. I and think how, even if you do, you got to have an eye for it. So you if have you're to have creative, a passion and an eye and a talent yeah. for it. But you have to also understand that you know color palettes are a big big way to to cater to demographics if you're selling a home. Interesting. And 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 you got to do your your research on what kind of people are in the area and what kind of income bracket they are, what kind of nucleus you live around from restaurants to you know uh, schools and what kind of uh, family is going to be buying your home, what age brackets and income. So you got to think of all this and who you're catering to. You don't want to make your home for you if you're trying to sell it. You want to make it cater to them. So you learn about earth tone colors, throw pillows, fireplaces, staging the properties, uh, visuals, focal points, all kinds of great things that you would see as a, as a buyer because you only get one time to make a first impression. So uh, I started getting into the investment side of this and started looking at the dollars and how I can build these teams and how I can really make more profit. So um, I own a mortgage company now because I, I learned how to make money through the mortgage points and I learned how Here, to- Here, yeah. based out of a- Yeah, open in 49 states. Got it. 
and uh, and and I have a small but efficient real estate company, brokerage, everything. So we we do it in house, and and all my people, I you know I take them on trips, and we do I buy them lunch every day. Solid. My people love me, and, and I love how them. How long has this been? Twenty three years awesome. of, of building this whole thing up to where it is now. Wow. And my TV show has been running eight years of the Vanilla Ice Project. So it's not just here's a rapper one day and here he is doing homes. I did this. This has been a long time. Good for you, man. And. Um, and I love it, you know. So uh, there's oh, so many different ways to make money and and happiness and fun and art and creativity that I just love it. And it's a, you got to be built for it. It is tough, but you know I lose a lot of sleep thinking about what I'm going to do next. You know, ah. I go to Europe uh, to to go to like builder shows so that I purposely stuff that I introduce on my homes is not something you're going to see on any other TV show, whether it's a construction or a design show, you're not going to see it because I'm going through the far reaches of the universe. I go to Latvia, Estonia, to builder shows, to stuff that you're not going to get on aisle 10 in the local hardware stores here. You're not going to find it. And then people are always like, wow, where did he get that idea? Where did he come up with this? International builder shows. I find them everywhere. I lose sleep thinking about it and I'm just loving to showcase it on my show. So my show is not a flip show. It's a uh, pretty much a, a design show, really. The latest and greatest in home technology and home design. And even my show has taken on a life of its own. If you watch season one to season eight, it's, it's evolved. And it just gets bigger and better every season. And as you can see, I can talk about this forever because yeah, this is like my passion. Yeah, I can tell you excited about it. So, you know, the old school and Tupac and all that, that's 20 something odd years ago. And it's cool and I can talk about it. But I think more people are interested now with what I'm doing lately and, and what I'm doing with with the real estate because I have a lot of top designers and stuff that look at how I do things and stuff and they're my mentors <laughs> and I, I look up to them and they're following some of my trends I, I'm starting to see a lot of my trends yeah. in certain design features you know and it's amazing that I get a chance to showcase this to the world and we have over 100 million viewers watching this show so I'm, I'm honored that so many people gravitate towards it and I think that my show by what I hear everywhere and everybody talking has inspired people to put more money in their house and because they get it out in happiness. Your home is your sanctuary. Your home is where you like, even after a great vacation, you just go, I can't wait to get home. After your whole long day at work, where do you want to go? I want to go home. I just want to go home. <laughs> you sure you're not a, a, an entrepreneur at heart instead of just because because if, if you would have never done any music and I didn't know you and you just got into business, you sound like a CEO of a real estate company. You sound like a guy running a big business. You know, I you, am, you, you and I've become that. Sound, yeah, it, it, and, and it's, it's amazing. It's, it's trying to put that identity behind to see who is Rob versus, you know, obviously that identity also helps as well. But you, you sound like you're, you're selling like a pro. You're communicating like a pro. I love what I, I do, man. I can, you give me a cup of coffee, oozing, I'll, I'll talk your ear off. out of you. So, <laughs> Brother, where can, we, where can everybody see the show? For some people that don't, I know there's 100 million people that do, but those who don't, where can they find, find your show? Um, the show is on DIY Network. Uh, it's a DIY channel, pretty much. Uh, it's an upgrade package, so if you don't get it on your regular basic cable, it's $12 extra a month. Get the upgrade package, you'll get, you'll get the DIY Network, which will it'll blow you away. It's, uh, it's part of Scripps Network, so it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's owned by the same companies as HGTV, DIY Network, Cooking Channel, Travel Channel, all these are the same big corporation called Scripps Network. So uh, get the upgrade package, you can get all these channels and it's an amazing thing to uh, show people how to do it yourself at home. Where, where, do, where should people follow you that links always back to the show? Is that Instagram you push uh, or, or are you more a Twitter guy? Um, I do them all man, I do okay. Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, so I'm all over. I got my own website, Vanilla Ice, it's really simple, I mean we call it simple as a pimple, at Vanilla Ice. So you can't get That's any more it. simple than that. So we're going to put all the links on the bottom to go visit the project that he's working on. Rob, a.k.a. Vanilla Ice. Brother, My thank man. you for your time. Really oh, enjoyed anytime, it together brother. at your place, man. My pleasure. This was Welcome. cool. Yeah. Official Vanilla Ice.